Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is the video edition of my Tech Guy podcast. Because we didn't want to send you six hours of video every week, we've edited this down to just the best bits from uh, two shows, Saturday and Sunday, September 11th and 12th, 2010. These are episodes 699 and 700. Enjoy. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Talking high tech right now, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. You want to talk about this amazing world of digital technology that's surrounding us right now. Diana's on the line for Burbank with a dead pavilion. Yeah, just, you know, have have no idea. It sounds like the hard drive spinning up, cause I, and I know the computer is starting okay because it does this little beep thing, but then right now I'm sitting here looking at the screen. It's the... Basically, the introduction that you know it's an HP. It's just computer. stuck on that on that HP welcome screen. It never gets past that. That you are correct, sir. I am correct. Hit hit the escape key. Escape key again. Okay. Uh, oh wait. Oops. What that does is that gets rid of. It usually gets rid of the HP ad. Huh. And sh okay. and shows what's underneath. All right. I was I hid the keyboard because I didn't want to okay. miss anything. I, I just want to see if you could see anything underneath it. I when you know. said it beeps, does it beep once or does it beep a number of times? It does one beep. One beep, okay. Okay, and I'm hitting the escape key is doing nothing. Nothing, so just kind of frozen in time. What's this? Uh, probably. What I was trying to find out is where it's dying. It's dying somewhere, obviously, but, but it, it, the um, problem depends. You, know, the, you can see what's going wrong if you can tell where it's dying. It's dying before, it's, before Windows loads. Okay. But it could be... And we can't tell because it's HP ad. You might want to turn it off and on again and hit escape as soon as that HP ad comes up. See if you can see behind the ad and see where it is. Because what you want to know is, well, are you, are you getting through the power on self-test? Are you getting to the, through the BIOS and then trying to hit the hard drive and then there's nothing there? Or is it, is it something later or earlier in the boot sequence? And that's where, kind of where you want to know what's gone right. wrong. So I'll give, you the, I'll give you the range of things that could be wrong. It is old enough that it could simply be that the battery that backs up all the settings in the computer, the little quarter-sized lithium battery, is dead. Really? Yeah, and then the, what that means is the computer loses its mind. It's like aliens have sucked its brains out. And it, doesn't, and it goes, I don't know what to do now. And so it could be something as simple as that. Uh, that would be a very quick fix. You go to, you know, the drugstore, you pick up a, a battery. It's uh, usually a CR20, but you'll have to open up the case and find Is it a laptop or desktop? It's a tower, and I've got it open right now. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, so you see that little silver quarter uh, on the motherboard. You, you, you replace that CMOS battery. Maybe that's all that's wrong. Um, it could also, however, be that the hard drive controller died, so it's starting up, but then it says, well, I need a hard drive, and it doesn't see anything. It could also be that the hard drive controller is fine, the CMOS battery is fine, the... Memory's fine, but as soon as it hits the hard drive, the data that's in the master boot record, which is that very first thing it reads, is damaged, and it it frees at that point. It could be that it gets through all of that, and then starts to load Windows, and Windows is damaged, and it it could be a it literally, it's not likely because it's an old machine. It's probably something more serious, but it could literally be, we are hit, we are bombarded all the time by particles from the sun, cosmic rays, and if one, and they hit your hard drive all the time, and they switch bits all the time. Thousands of times a day. But it's like uh, a, a, a meteor hitting the Earth that hits the ocean most of the time. Uh, uh, if you think you're changing one bit on a drive that has gazillion bits, chances are it's not going to make any difference. But if it hits that one bit on that one file that you really need to load, then it won't load. So it could be, could be something so simple as that. So it's really hard for me to tell just because of where you are exactly Okay, I mean, you gave me a bunch of different options, which is very good. I have yet to take any, I have two hard drives in there, and I have yet to take the master out and put it in a hard drive extra enclosure. That's what I would do, see if that's okay. If you had spin right, you could run it, but I don't know if you could get to, I don't know how far you're getting is the problem. So reboot, right. you know, turn the machine off and on again, and hit escape as soon as that HP logo comes up, and see if you can see what you want to see, and that's why I don't like these logos is you want to see what's going on underneath them. They hide them because they go, they, oh, it'll scare people if you see that. But you need that. That's diagnostic. It's going to say, yeah, I see the hard drive. Yeah, the BIOS test is fine. The memory test is fine. Now we're going to try to hit the hard drive. Then you would know where you're dying. 
Well, I, I did exactly that, and it's it, nothing. It's still got the, I've got my frozen. Screen. You can't, you still can't see anything. Or try to delete. There are other keys. If you can get into the bio setup, okay, that will tell you something, too. This is what I love about your show also being the whole podcast thing, because you're, you're telling me all this stuff, and I'm not even going to try to take <laughs> don't, it. Don't remember a thing. Just uh, We'll write it down and, uh, and either watch the podcast and rewind four times or uh, go to the website, techguylabs.com, and we'll put the step-by-step -step there for you. It's yeah. kind of, I'm really not helping you much. I'm just giving you a range of possibilities. The first thing I would do, though, since it's five years old, that's about how long those CMOS batteries last. Oh, oh that's First thing know. I'd do is I'd pop it out, go to the drugstore, get another one, pop it in, and then get into your BIOS... And you'll want to kind of reset the BIOS to defaults. Okay. So what, what may have happened is the battery died and the BIOS is set really strangely. Okay. Also, okay. another thing I try, and this is uh, just something that I've had happen to me and it's worth a try, is unplug all the USB devices. Okay. Sometimes a USB device can block the boot. I always, when I'm having trouble booting, I always unplug all the USB devices, including if you want the keyboard and mouse, and just see what happens. Oh, well, there you go. That's that's another helpful little tidbit. So that's wonderful, Leo. I mean, you know, you know what you're talking about, and that's why I call you. So, hey. Well, it's so good to talk to you, Diana. Thank you. I was talking to Diana before the break, and I mentioned that uh, she could have a hard drive problem. That's a very, very common problem. And I said that, you know, it can be, it, it happens all the time thanks to cosmic rays. And I was mocked. I was mocked in the chat room. And in fact, if you search for on Google, cosmic rays and hard drive you will find my friend steve bass who writes for pc world this is an article from a few years ago radio show host leo laporte has a remarkable theory for why internet explorer keeps crashing he he says it's cosmic rays it is cosmic it is. <laughs> i know i sound like i'm nuts i know i should be i know i should be on with george nori and uh, and uh, talk about this on late night but in fact, it's true. And I did find an article, and you could search for it, from Sun Microsystems, talking about cosmic ray errors in memory, in, in RAM. These, these particles are flying, you know, mostly they're eaten up by the atmosphere, although the interaction with the atmosphere can cause chain reactions, other particles can come down. They're flying through us all the time. It happens all the time. It's just part of, you know, life on the planet Earth. Thank goodness we've got that thin layer of atmosphere to protect us. And they hit us and your hardware, uh, you know, at the same time. And, and chip designers know about this. In fact, they, they do their best to shield chips from these kinds of stray particles. Hard drives, too. But stuff does get through. Let me, let me rephrase it in a way that doesn't sound so crackpot and doesn't cause people to start wrapping their computers in tin foil. If you look at, uh, if you use software to see how many errors your hard drive is spewing out, you will see that a normal hard drive spews thousands of errors an hour, sometimes a minute, constantly erroring. And it's because we're, we're making these hard drives one and two terabytes, very, very densely packed data on a small disk. Errors are normal, but we also build into the hard drive error correction technology, ECC, that most of the time, solves the problem, corrects the error. In fact, that's what you're looking at. When you look at these, uh, use something like SpinRet to look at the hard drive errors, you're seeing ECC uh, reports. You're seeing how many times the hard drive corrected an error properly via error correction. Nevertheless, er you still have errors. And if an error happens in a bad spot, it can cause a problem. It can cause the computer not to run. It's not probably the most common cause of computer failure but it, it's one of them so i defend myself <laughs> this does happen <laughs> i'm not nuts probably not germane to bring it up because so many other things can go wrong just wear and tear on the hard drive think about it your hard drive's rotating seven thousand two hundred times a minute for five years it's amazing it works at all Melanie, Riverside, California. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Melanie. Hey, Leo. Um, my 400 email contacts were spammed with a fraudulent email mm -hmm. and uh, with a story requesting money from them. And I think they got, the scammers got my contact list through Facebook. And now I already know not to click on anything and then use my password and stuff. So I'm not quite sure how this happened. Let me ask you some questions. So they, everybody on your address book got the spam. Did the spam have 
your name in it and relevant details that might make people that think it was legitimate from you? In other uh, words, was it a customized message? No. Okay. It didn't say, hi, this is Melanie. Correct. Okay. So there's... Th this, there is a scam out there, and uh, I, I know people have been bit by it, where um, bad guys get into your account. They guess your password, or they guess your secret answer to your question. They somehow get your password. They go in there, they read some of your emails, they get your name, they get your address book, and they send, and this is very effective, by the way, they send out an email over your name, not just, you know, from Melanie, but saying, hi, it's Melanie. Now, I got one of these for my uh, gardener. I mentioned this last week. We, we just hired this guy as a gardener. He says, it's Owen. I'm in London. I lost my passport. I got robbed. I'm stuck here. I can't pay the hotel bill. I can't get home. If you could just wire me a thousand bucks, I'd pay you back the minute I get home and then I can get back to work gardening. Now, my wife said, wow, this says it's Owen. He knows they know he's our gardener. It must be real. No, it was a bad guy that got into his Yahoo mail account. So that's why I asked you if it's personalized. So that's one possibility. There's well, that it was almost that exact email, except it didn't say my name in the. Okay, the so they were lazy. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't bother. They didn't bother customizing it. Yeah. But but it was that kind of a, a scam. Exactly. Yeah, it's likely, and you think it's. Why do you think it's your Facebook? Um, that was the only thing I could think of. Do you have web-based mail? Do you have Yahoo or Hotmail or or Gmail? Um, y yes, I have, um, well, it's through MSN. MSN, stuff. same thing. So that's another possible route. It, what you have to look at is where, where's my address book online? Okay. Now there's another, that's one category of scam. That's, by the way, not so troubling because all you have to do is change your password. And right, I, and I did do that. What was really odd, though, was that they kept forwarding mail to another, my personal email to another account. So when people would respond to that email, right. it was getting forwarded elsewhere. They have to do that. So uh, you have to look at your settings and, and make sure, go through your, that sounds like it was MSN, not, I don't think Facebook will forward responses to you to another email. Okay. So, but, but look, but look, I would look at all your settings Make sure there's no email forwarding going on, that you have disabled the ability to get, for instance, you can get your MSN mail in a in Outlook. Make sure that's not turned on because what they could have done is said, okay, good, I've got her password and I'm going to turn that on. But, the, but if you change the password and you disable email forwarding in all your accounts, you should be done. Now, that, but I said that's only one of two possibilities. There's also the possibility that spyware got on your system and they got your contact books, your contacts from your system. And traditional viruses work this way. And they used Outlook or whatever email program you use to send this out. That's a little more scary because that means they're in your computer and then you have, and rooting it out of your computer is extraordinarily difficult. So. Well, I did contact MSN, uh, well, actually Verizon, who I work through. And um, they did put some malware um, program on my computer to try and get rid of any of that. Yeah, but I have to tell you, any malware software is usually not adequate. Do you, do you, do you have an antivirus system that you're using? Norton. Okay. And you keep it up to date? Yes. And Norton's not reporting an infection? Correct. Okay. I think you're okay. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I hate it when their response is, well, here's some anti-malware software. That's not a good response. If you have malware on there, if you really truly have malware on there, most anti-malware software will not effectively remove it. What, because what malware does now, they're smart. They're not stupid. These guys are, are clever. They root into your system in a way that if you eradicate it, your system stops working. And, and antivirus programs know this. They're not going to, if, if, if this malware is in a, is hidden away in a Windows system file and they find it, they can't delete the Windows system file or your system won't boot. So any malware is not usually effective. If it's on your system, you got to really got to format your system to start over. But I don't, I don't think it is on your system. I think this sounds like they got into an online mail account. Okay, because I don't, I haven't had any problem in the last 24 hours and I've been checking every five minutes to make sure my email isn't forwarded any longer. Um, I'm just not quite sure what to do from this point 
on to protect myself against this? Because I know you talked about a program. Um, for mm, no power. program will protect you. Here's what you want to do. Well, I, you know, I will tell you what that program is. No program will protect you, but you do need to have good, strong passwords. Change them, you know, every few months. The, the way these guys often get in is either they guess your password, which means you had a password that's like a dictionary word, you know, or your dog's name, something they could easily guess. Or, and this is most common, this is how Paris Hilton got hacked, they know the answers to your secret questions. And uh, if you use something obvious as your, you know, my mother's maiden name, people can find that. Paris Hilton was using the name of her dog. Now, everybody knows, well, everybody watches TV, knows the name of Paris Hilton's dog. So, of course, they were able to hack her system. I think most systems, MSN included, it's not sufficient to know the secret question answers. You have to go through, you know, it'll email you at a password reset to another address. Make sure you have a second address in there that's your backup address, things like that. Um, but, yeah, it, it, the program I was talking about is LastPass. Excellent program. It will generate good, strong passwords for you and make it easy enough to remember and change them that you won't hesitate to do that on a regular basis. Every quarter is sufficient, every three months. And that is my problem is trying to remember yeah, of course. the different passwords for all the different programs changing every few months. Yeah, of course. That's everybody's problem. So what LastPass does is it stores your password for you. It will generate a strong password, and then it will store it for you. Uh, it works on Windows, Mac, Linux, almost all the smartphones. And that's the reason I use it, because I have it on everything. And I don't remember passwords anymore. You just remember one master password that's your that gets you to the LastPass, and then the LastPass tells you the password for MSN Mail or whatever else you're using. I see. And where do I get that? LastPass.com. It's free, although... For a buck a month, you can get the pro version with some additional features, but all you really need is the free version. LastPass.com. That's perfect. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And I think you're going to be okay, Melanie. If you do these changes and the, the mail stops, then you're probably all right. Especially since okay. Norton's saying no infection. Norton's Look, Norton's uh, not my favorite antivirus, but if it says there's no infection, the chances are pretty good there's no infection. Okay. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank you, Melanie. I'm glad you called because this is a very common problem. In fact, it's, we got a call last week, the same exact thing. These, this is a new scam. that People get into your online mail account and send messages to everybody you know that come from you. That, that it, Often they do customize. It makes it look like it really is you. Please send me some money. And it works. My, my wife was about to send our gardener <laughs> $1,000. He's not in London. I said, ah, before you do that. I would call Owen and see if he's in London. He wasn't in London. <laughs> he wasn't anywhere. He was home. He was gardening. So this is a, this is this is effective because it seems to come from somebody you know with personal information in the email that only they could know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 88 88 ask Leo. 1 827 5536. That's the phone number. Broadcasting from Paradise City, all around the world. And to Mark in St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Mark, Leo Laporte, the Tech Hi, Hi, Leo. Hey. I've been using Google Voice um, to transcribe voicemails. <laughs> How's that working out for you? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but Google, has it been doing a good job? No. Yeah. Google. <laughs> I do, too. And uh, uh, I love I love Google. Boy, I'm not knocking Google Voice. I love Google Voice. It's uh, free, so you can't really knock it. Um, I have it set up so that it rings all my phones. I have one number. That's the number I give out, and I can control which phones it rings. And even now, because of voice built into chat, I, I, when I have my Gmail uh, on my front page, which I always do, my, my, my web page rings, and I can answer through the computer, too. Plus, it, uh, I can have different outgoing voicemail messages for different groups of people. It confused the heck out of my wife. She said, do you always say I love you uh, when everybody calls? And I said, no, that's your dedicated outbound message. <laughs> oh, she, I think she still doesn't really under, understand why my outbound voice message says, I love you, honey. Uh, but uh, <laughs> technology sometimes escapes us. And the best part, and this is what you're, you're experiencing is, it will email you the audio of the message and text message you the audio of the message. And attached to that email and text are Google's best guess at what people said. But now, as you know, with phone audio, 
that best guess can also be pretty horrible. Well, I've tried the phone and I've tried uh, my MacBook Pro. And what I'm trying to do is to save the cost of buying voice recognition. Yeah, software. good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of phone do you have? Um, uh, probably a cheap one. No, a feature phone, not a smartphone. Yeah, because uh, there's Dragon um, uh, Dictate for uh, iPhone does a pretty good job. You speak into the phone. And it sends it out to the server and sends it back. In fact, if you have an Android phone, uh, Google has pretty good voice dictation, much better than it uses for the uh, Google Voice. But the Google Voice is pretty awful. In fact, really, I only use that to kind of get a general idea <laughs> of what that call might have been about. It really isn't useful for doing what you're doing, which is trying to, trying to use it for dictation. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you're... I, I have a BlackBerry, but where I live, the... Uh signal wasn't very good okay yeah i think the worst the signal of course the the worst it's going to be but even with good quality recording i have yet to see a decent uh result from the from the dictation in the in the google voice you want to really have a laugh go to youtube you know youtube has built-in auto captioning and <laughs> where it thinks it knows what it what it's saying and it'll caption it's te it's not even close it's terrible it's actually quite amusing Quite amusing, but uh, ne nevertheless, it, in mo in both cases, it's often good enough, but not for what you want to do. So you want you want to uh, like uh, while you're driving around, dictate notes, or how do you want to do this? Um, I'm about your same vintage, so I never learned how to type. Ah, um, when I when I'm producing a paper, um, it's a lot easier for me to dictate it than it right. is to try to type. And I guess I was trying to avoid the price of buying the real software that does that. Anybody in the chat room have a solution? So you'd like to do it into your BlackBerry? Well, I'd like to do it into my Mac computer. Into your Mac? Yeah. Hmm. And there is, of course, uh, a really good dictation solution for the Mac, but it's not, uh, it's not cheap. Um, so I'm trying to think of another way. This is, a, this is an interesting... Now, I, by the way, believe that it will get better and better. Google, one of the reasons Google um, is attempting this is because they had this Goog 411. I think I, at the time I thought, why are they giving away free information when the my phone company charges 75 cents or more for each 411 call? Why are they giving this away? Well, it turns out what Google was doing was collecting voice samples. And by by you know when you when you call Goog 411 and you, it says city please and you tell it the city and then it it does its best guess. But if it's wrong, you correct it. You say no no that was wrong. Do it again. And by collecting this information kind of automatically, Google believes it's gotten better and better at voice dictation. I have to say it has, but it's not yet that good. And maybe in a few years it will get that good. They're getting a lot of data. I mean, I would, if I were you, I would go spend the money on uh, on Max Speech, which is the it's basically based on the Dragon okay. uh, system, and uh, it works much better. Nothing's perfect. Don't uh, don't. Um, be be deceived by the promise of these things um but but a lot of people who have carpal tunnel or who can't type use these kinds of systems uh my friend david pogue who writes for the new york times doesn't write his books with dragon but he does the whole index that way so it's good enough and he's gotten quite good at it so i would look at it at max speech that's the mac version of this is maxspeech.com okay the other issue is when you get into a specialty like the right. medical version of it right. seems to skyrocket. Yeah, because they can get it. It's interesting because especially uh, is better. Especially vocabs are better because they're limited vocabularies. So a lot of radiologists, for instance, as they're reading X-rays, will dictate it. And because it's very, you know, it's very, it's kind of rigid format. Um, they do these these in in medical dictation. They do very very well. But you're right. It's expensive because they know they can get it. It's especially it's a smaller market so they want to charge more to kind of amortize the cost um but you're right it is more expensive and maybe in time google will get better and better and we won't have to uh, buy this i think that's google's plan anyway among other <laughs> among other things it's their plan to rule the world in fact right. if you think about it uh good speech recognition is very valuable for google because where google makes its money is selling advertising based on the content of your emails the content of your searches wouldn't it be Great for them if they could also base advertising on the content of your phone calls. 
Why? Of course. Why are they? Why are they giving away free phone calls? Because they'd like to listen to the call. Not, but no human listening. Just the computer listening. Not trying to understand it. Just looking for keywords, but understanding it well enough to put an ad up that's relevant to what you were just talking about, or relevant to the messages posted. That's why they're doing it. I mean, they are a business. They they don't give away stuff just because they like you. So there's a lot of incentive for them to get better at this transcription thing, and I think they will. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know, we were talking uh, with our trucker uh, before the last break about uh, getting a MiFi device. There is a device uh, out there called the AutoNet that is designed to put... <laughs> it goes in your trunk. It, it's designed to put Wi-Fi in your car. This is how far we've come now. People... People actually, you know, want Wi-Fi in their car so that the kids can surf and all of that stuff. So it's autonetmobile.com. It's uh, it uses 3G, so it's you know it's similar to uh, you know any of these other solutions like the MiFi, but it uh, but it goes in the trunk of your car. It's got big antennas and it basically wires the car up. Uh, Sixty bucks a month, same same cost as a MiFi. So it's it's a Wi-Fi hotspot for your car. It's kind of CarFi, they call it. It's kind of an interesting uh, solution. I, I, if anybody's used that, I'd love to hear about that as well. That voice you hear, that disembodied wow, comes from my good buddy and gadget hound, Dick D. Bartolo, <laughs> Mad Magazine's maddest writer for four decades now. Dickie D., how are you? I'm super, and you, sir? I'm very well. Dick does a show with us called The Daily Gizwiz, Monday through Friday. It's a podcast you can subscribe, you can, you can subscribe yeah. to. Uh, on, uh, it's on the, uh, on the iTunes or the Zoom thing there. If you, uh, and how's that working out it's, for you? <laughs> it's working out great. If you go to twit.tv slash DGW for Daily Gizwiz, you can find it. Or go to Dick's website, gizwiz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z -I -Z dot biz. A lot of Zs in there. Mm, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, what is your what is your gadget of the day today, Dick? Our gadget of the day is something really fun from our friends at Wowie. They make the robots, Robo Sapien, and the ill-fated uh, Elvis Presley, <laughs> who had so many motors in him. He, you heard more uh, mechanical <laughs> sounds than the. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Love me, <laughs> tender. <laughs> Love me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is more down to earth. It's a new line called Paper Jams. And Paper Jams are musical instruments about one inch thick. And when you take the uh, guitar out of the wrapping, you go, how can I play this? There are no strings. Well, the strings are, it's a photograph of strings, but yet <laughs> when picture. you strum them, they are enabled through the paper so you actually can make chords there are three ways to play it you can do perfect play where you actually are letting the recorder there are three songs in each guitar i'll play, play, I'll play a little bit as you talk yeah, yeah do it this is from the uh, wowie website that, this is actual music from these pieces of paper yes, yes. press the mode button until you hear a chord pick a song strum once that starts to beat the counts you in. So it's to kind of, I, it looks like it's kind of to take off on the Guitar Hero crowd, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly uh, right. And they, they have, uh, they have the, the uh, Paper Jams drums and they have a Paper Jams amplifier. This is so, so you can, cool. It, it's, it's very clever. And it, they're, what they're age group would cool. you say this is for? You know, I think they're shooting for uh, like eight to twelve. So in my sixteen-year-old probably wouldn't want to get this. Probably. Well, like, you know what? Everybody. Well, I had it fun here. To have for I took a it party. Up to yeah, every. Yes, exactly. Everybody wants to play with it, and it comes with a headphone jack. So if you live in a small apartment, the kids can play and entertain themselves. Um, the amp, the uh, guitars are twenty-five dollars. There's a bunch of different styles. The drums are fifteen dollars. And the uh, amplifier is fifteen bucks, and everything's battery operated. And you only but need one, right? You, you only need one. You okay. you can just do the guitar if you want. Although it looks and, like uh, they have a deal, like on Amazon, for uh, sixty four dollars, you could get the guitar, two guitars, and an, and a quote amp. 
What, oh, is, the, okay. what is the amp do? It's just a paper amp. The amp. Yes, the amp. It's a paper amp, so you can make it even louder. It has a speaker in it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, yeah. That's I mean, in a photograph, you would really look amazing. Like, wow. How but, did oh, those that's kids the thing. Have, yeah, because all the. Right. Yeah. It's just paper. It's, yeah. It's paper. Yeah. Paper oh, jams funny. from Wowie. Very cool. Dick DiBartolo, go to gizwiz.biz. You can play his What the Heck Is It game. It's a fun game. He has a picture close up of uh, some gadget or other. And uh, if you guess correctly, you could win a Mad Magazine. And even if you guess wrong, if you just guess cleverly, he'll send you an autographed copy of a Mad Magazine. If we and, pick you a winner, that is correct. And you have something like 24 to give away, something like that. Uh, yeah, we gave away uh, 36 to pass the uh, game. That's great, Dick. We'll, We're generous. We're generous. We'll see you later on the Daily Gizwiz. I'll be here. All right, Dickie D. Bartolo. See if I get one more call in before we wrap up the show. Chris in Chino Hills, California. You're the lucky winner. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leo. How you doing? I'm great. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Yeah, I bought the uh, TomTom Tom 1 in 2008. Great little and, GPS, uh, especially for the price. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, it was. Um, now, I downloaded stuff off of the TomTom Tom website, um, mm -hmm. like little symbols for the car that you can right. have. And there's a, when it starts up, it shows pictures. I downloaded pictures off the TomTom Tom website for that. Now, when I do the, the system updates for it, it updates only a certain amount. And then at the end, it says it can't do a full update yeah. due to a certain image. It says, like, image two. Yep, I've had that not, exact problem. Not, See, this is, there's an advantage and disadvantage to TomTom. Tom. The advantage is you can customize the voice, customize the picture, customize the icons. You can customize like crazy. There's user-generated content, user maps. It really is designed to be kind of an upgradable system. You use the TomTom Tom hardware or software to do it. Um, but I have crashed my TomTom. Tom. So that's the negative. <laughs> as soon as you're changing it, you can crash it. And I think I had the same problem with the bad image. I, what I did is I went to the TomTom Tom forums and I searched for it. And they tell you there's stuff you can delete. There's ways to modify it. They tell you where the backup is that you can restore. So it's, it, uh -huh. it, it just takes a little hacking around with it, but you can fix it. And I, did, I was able to get my TomTom -Tom booting again. I had it set up so that I would never boot because I had some bad image on it. Because anytime I go to the TomTom -Tom website and uh, try to do factory reset, it actually doesn't take the pictures off of the car symbols. Right. It just erases the information I, I'm I, as I remember and I don't remember the details I think I had to actually go either go into the TomTom -tom or go into the backup and uh, remove a file by hand but this was documented in the forums I'm not sure exactly where They're, but they have very good TomTomForums.com they have very good forums okay well, thank you very much Leo don't give up you can fix it I fixed mine hey thank you all for being here have a great geek week we'll see you next time Well, hello there. How are you? Good to see you, my friend. It's time to talk tech. Leo Laporte here. I am the tech guy, and this is the show where we talk about what's happening in the world of technology all around us. Whether it's uh, Google, Microsoft, Apple, cell phones, MP3 players, digital photography, it's all grist for the mill. The grist for the digital mill, as it were. Anything with a chip in it. We'll grind it up and spit it out. Will it blend? You bet it will. 88. <laughs> Have you seen that website? You've seen that web. Will it blend? It's very funny. It's a, a blender company. But you see, this is where I get, I find it really interesting to see the winners and the losers in the new, the new economy. Let's face it. It's a new economy, isn't it? I mean, can we, can we all agree on that? And it's very much informed by the shift in, um, in technology. Just as the industrial era began with steam engines, mass production, factories. Uh, the digital era, our information era, began with computers, then the Internet, then worldwide instantaneous communications. And it's changing everything. It's weak. You know, it's, I don't have to tell you that it's changing the way you buy airplane tickets. It's the way you buy music, the way you buy almost anything. It's changing the way you work. So many of us don't even work in the office anymore. I do this show from a little cottage in northern california in the wine country because i can thanks to digital technology i mean in every aspect in every area it's it's changing isn't it we're in a new world a new economy and it's interesting to see how some companies get it and some companies don't polaroid didn't get it 
<laughs> they were stuck on instant film. Didn't matter, you know. But there's still a brand called Polaroid around. It has nothing to do with Polaroid cameras. Although I guess somebody's making Polaroid film still, not Polaroid. Kodak, on the other hand, did get it. It was a struggle. It was a struggle. Here's a film camera company that slowly pivoted that huge tanker ship to point towards digital and has done pretty well. They've survived anyway, and you can't say that for Polaroid. Some companies get it. Some companies uh, don't get it. And, uh, and that's kind of, uh, kind of the soap opera that's, that's going on right now, is watching which ones do and, and which ones don't. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number if you want to talk about tech. Mostly I know people call in and say, you know, my Windows machine is kerfluggin' or I can't get this thing to interoperate with that thing or which cell phone should I buy? And that's fine. We could talk about all of that stuff. But uh, your comments, too, upon the greater issues of the day are fine as well. In fact, maybe we could talk today about which companies get it, which companies do you think will survive, and which companies won't. And half the time when we, when we take these calls, uh, like yesterday, Somebody called up and said, I'm working on a Mac, but my library uh, lends audio books that only work on Windows machines. What's the story here? And there's an example of a... Now, I don't blame the public library system. Goodness knows there's no budget. There's no money for them. And they're kind of uh, at the mercy of the publishing companies. But here's... They're the companies that in many cases don't get it. They don't get that. Uh, they're, they're driving customers away. They're not facing the digital era full on they're afraid mostly people are afraid i think of the change and they can't they can't they can't handle the truth they can't handle the fact that their distribution is going to go away from you know not trucks and printing presses on paper dead trees bound into volumes that are shipped to bookstores where people go in their cars to pick them up nah, uh -uh. <clears throat> that's gone uh, you can bemoan it i certainly do i love the bookstore I went to the bookstore last night love bookstores but whether you love them or hate them it doesn't it's not germane it's they're going away they're going away because people are buying on their kindles and downloading and, and so any company that wants to survive in that new world has to understand that and say well what does that mean for our business how do we adjust how do we make it work and sometimes you can't if your company is a dead tree printing press company well i think maybe you can't or it's going to be tough, or your customers are going to... But maybe you can. Maybe you can... You know what geeks love these days? <laughs> as long, uh, uh, it's interesting to watch, because when there's a digital transition, and everybody's doing everything digitally, then there's always this kind of celebration of... It's almost a nostalgia for the old way of doing things. So geeks like this thing called letterpress. And it, it's, it's a very old-fashioned form of printing, where it prints it so hard, it's like a... It's a press... And it prints it so hard, it, it, it indents the, the text into paper. And you'll see geeks, I, I get cards fairly frequently, and they're very expensive from geeks that are letter-pressed. They're on thick cardstock. It's, it's almost like you're back to the 1860s. Thick cardstock with letters embedded deeply into this, and they're almost embossed into there. And it's a nostalgia for that. So, there, you know, even people who make printing and build printing presses and have businesses, they can find a way. They've become boutique specialty companies, just as there are companies now that continue to print vinyl records and tube amplifiers. And yes, you could still buy a turntable. There's still a market for it. It's a specialty market. So they're very expensive now. So you could still survive. As the world moves one way, there's always a few who say, I miss those good old days. Somebody was saying, well, the, the newspaper isn't going to go away. It's going to become a luxury product. I think we could see pretty... Clearly now, the, the fog is starting to lift that we're not going to get a newspaper delivered to our door in years to come. Just as the milkman went the way of the buggy whip. Now, I know there's still milkmen around. In fact, my mom can still get a milkman who delivers to her doorstep milk in bottles. <laughs> but it's rare and weird. <laughs> most of us do not have a milkman anymore. Similarly, I don't think most of us will get the newspaper delivered, nicely rolled up with a rubber band into the bush by a young lad on his banana bike anymore because it's too expensive. It just costs too much and we can get it instantly over the internet. But there will be a few, a luxury few, 
who will get the newspaper brought to them by Jeeves, their butler, ironed with an iron. <laughs> Perfectly crisp. I think it was Corey Doctorow, my friend Corey, who was very much a futurist and uh, forward-thinking fellow, who said they'll always be that. They'll always be that. 88, 88, and I suppose there's somebody somewhere still making buggy whips. I don't know if they're for horses, but they're still being made, aren't they? Sure they are. 8888 ask Leah. If you're outside of the U.S., that's toll-free in the U.S., but outside the U.S., you can call 888-827-5536. Use uh, Skype to call, and it's a toll-free number in the U.S., so Skype will make it free uh, anywhere in the world. You can also follow along on our website, techguylabs.com. And you'll find there on the techguylabs.com links to the chat room. Always fun. The kids in the back of the class, I call them. Sitting there chatting away. And I watch uh, the chat room as, as, as you do the show. So it's a great way to, to give me feedback and answers. I think of them as my brain externalized. So if I, if I, uh, if I can't remember something, I just say, chat room. And they come, they come up with something. So you can get into there by going to techguylabs.com and clicking the chat link. There are, uh, there's also a uh, link there to the live video, so you can see, you can peep into my studio. No charge for that. I know some, I know many hosts charge for that. See, I, uh, I know my audience. I can't get away with that. <laughs> I'd, you know, I'd love, hey, I'd love to charge you five bucks to watch me sit on a ball and do the show. Sure, if I could get away with it, I would. But you know, this is the problem. When you do a show for technically savvy people, and maybe not everybody who listens is, but enough of you are, that if I were to make a paid stream, there'd be a number of you, wouldn't there, who would figure out a way to reflect it in a, in a free manner to anybody who wanted to see it. And I don't want to play whack-a-mole, so we give it away. Because after all, the more people who watch, the happier I am, and the happier our advertisers are, so it's okay. You'll find that there at techguylabs.com. And if you want uh, uh, episode information, links, things we talk about coming up in just a little bit, we're going to talk to Scott Wilkinson about home theater, for example. You'll find links there. And all you have to do is go to episode 700. Can you believe it? Our 700th episode today. And this, and by the way, it's not my 700th show of all time. Just since I started doing the Tech Guy show, which was in January 2004, six years ago. That's about right, right? 104 shows a year. Six years ago in January 2004, but, but I've been doing the show of this kind, a call-in radio talk show about technology since 1990, 91, something like that. Full-time, and I think went full-time doing this in 92. So 18 years. So three times that. So well over 2,000 shows now. But we're, we started counting. In, <laughs> we'll call this uh, ATG, After Tech Guy, episode 700 ATG. TechGuyLabs.com, 8888. Ask Leo's the phone number. I posted a link on my uh, Facebook and on Twitter to a, uh, an example of a company that gets it. We're talking about companies that don't and do. Samsung has made an ad that will go viral. I saw it uh, yesterday. Somebody in the chat room sent me the link, and maybe there were fifty or 60,000 people who viewed it. By the end of this week, it'll be $5 million, I guarantee you. Because the cutest video you ever saw. It's a little girl in what looks like, you know, a kindergarten or a nursery school dancing. You know how little girls dance on a mat. Just crazy falling around, dancing around. And uh, then two of the teachers come behind her and they start doing her dance with her. It's so cute. I'll let you watch the rest of it. I think it's called Cute Video of Girl Dancing. If you follow, if you go to my Twitter feed, twitter.com slash Leo Laporte, you'll see it. It's an ad at the end. Now, I think some people go, oh, man, like they feel cheated. Didn't bother me. I thought, nice, subtle, clever. Doesn't say it's an ad. It's just on YouTube. It's a little ad for Samsung. But after all, it's it's going to go viral. It's a clever way to advertise, isn't it? And it costs them nothing. Coming up in just a little bit, Scott Wilkinson, our home theater expert. But Richard's on the line from Nashville, Tennessee, with a question for me. Hello, Richard. Hey. Thanks for hanging uh, my on. My question after we got all that over with is the... Uh, <laughs> don't don't <laughs> never, never apologize. Love the love fest, baby. <laughs> there you go. Just sharing it. <laughs> my question, uh, I have a Lexmark printer, and I know you, you rarely get printer questions on the show, but uh, it's a great printer. However, it's been pre-programmed to warn me six months before I need ink, I think. Uh, I, I really hate Lexmark for that. They, I think they make some of the most expensive ink as well. It's really costly. 
I'm, I'm just looking to upgrade, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe a, a up to a laser jet instead of an ink jet this time. And it, is there anything out there that's not so unfriendly when it comes to ink? Yeah. Well, certainly the uh, laser jets are cost per page wise much cheaper. Uh, you pay more up front. But uh, you pay far, far less per page. And periodically, uh, magazines like PC Magazine will do printer roundups in which they'll talk about the cost of consumables. So if you Google printer consumables, you'll probably be able to find a table where it says the cost per page for various printers. Uh, a laser printer, usually four or five cents per page, including paper and ink, in this case toner. Inkjet printer, sometimes 20 to 25 cents a page, four or five times more. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. You know, yeah, inkjet printers are cheap. It's like selling, it's like giving away the razor and selling the blades. They make the money on the ink. And they really, really annoys me, and all the companies are doing this. They're putting chips in the ink that do two things. One, that prevent people from making compatible ink cartridges, which if you ask me is illegal. This is, we've, we, IBM did this in the 50s and got slapped around and in fact told, no, you have to allow something called plug compatibles. You have to allow third parties to make parts for your stuff. It ha in the auto industry, in the in the big mainframe industry, it should happen in the printer industry too. And I just don't know why somebody hasn't taken these guys to court on this one. The other is um, that uh, the chips warn you when you get low on ink, like as you say, a little too soon. Uh, I am a fan of the Canon printers myself. Uh, I use a uh, uh, um, Canon uh, inkjet printer. I think they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, at home, I use an Epson Artisan printer, which is a Wi-Fi-enabled printer, which means I don't have to connect it to a computer. I just have it on my Wi-Fi network. I can print from anywhere. It has. Uh, I, I got an all-in-one. The Artisan is an all-in-one, which has a scanner, a printer, a copier. Um, and it, it's a pretty nice printer. Um, if you're looking at lasers, my favorite is Epson. So Epson or Canon for inkjet and Epson lasers, I think I'm very happy with. Okay. Brother lasers uh, also very inexpensive, and the refills aren't too expensive. So there's some good choices out there. I wouldn't get Lexmark again. Never again. Yeah, Never. I wouldn't. I think they're very very expensive. But it's 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 too crazy. Yeah. No, I I would say you know Canon and Epson, and you know when it comes to professional printing, photographer photographers like Epson a lot. Um, so I'm very happy. I'm just looking here. Uh, somebody in the chat room is giving me a link to an Engadget article from last summer uh, where they talk about costs of ink and so forth. Um, if you just do a search, uh, that's too old. I would like to get one that's more recent. But if you just do a search, you'll see um, who costs the most per ink. But laser is a lot cheaper. But the problem with laser, it doesn't give you photo reproduction. So if you want to print photos, get an inkjet. Oh, I see. Okay. That's the, real, right. that's the real problem. You get color lasers, but they don't do a good job with photos. And if you want be the best-looking business documents, the laser is best. Okay. So I have, a, I have a laser at the office and a Canon at home because my kids want to print pictures and stuff like that. But it's kind of an office-use printer, so... Yeah, and I think, I think an, I, we use an, uh, an Epson uh, laser uh, printer that's just fantastic. It's uh, networked. Uh, it does scanning. It's an all-in-one. I'm very, very happy with it. Okay, great. Well, uh, keep on keeping on, Leo. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for the kind words. I cannot, you know, uh, PC Magazine, unfortunately, they've gone out of the print business. They're another example of where times have changed. PC Magazine used to do these printing roundups where they would test every printer. I can't test every printer. There's hundreds of them. It's prohibitively expensive, not to mention the time involved. But uh, I think PC Magazine online, PCMag.com, still probably does something like that. Will at least give you an idea of what, to, what printers are the best and how much costs the least. Um, I haven't tried Kodak. They're asking me in the chat room. I haven't tried Kodak printers. To me, it's Epson, Konica, or that, or nothing. Now, let's say hello to Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy. Hi, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Scott, hey. Scott writes for the Ultimate AV Magazine, ultimateavmag.com, and Home Theater Magazine, hometheatermag.com, and joins us every week to talk about home theater. That's right. Before we do that, though, uh, I guess I should say Shana Tova. Well, Shana Tova, Exactly. And, Happy New Year. Yep, it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur coming up. Are you doing your usual uh, thing? That's right. I'm blowing the shofar uh, this coming Friday night. 
um, in L.A. at uh, the Musicians Union, interestingly enough, but they have a great hall with a great sound system, and we're doing lots of music. My wife and I do a lot of music for that show, That's so true. a program, observance, shall we say. So uh, anybody in L.A., uh, go to sholem.org, S-H-O-L-E-M.org, uh, to find out exactly where and when, and uh, hope to see uh, some of you there. Great. Uh, the other thing I want to mention real quick. By the way, is, somebody just said blowing what? It's a Rams. Uh, it's a Rams horn, right? The shofar. Yes, it's called the shofar, or in Yiddish, shoifa. Shoifa. It's the shoifa. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the ram ritual uh, Jewish uh, Rams horn trumpet, and uh, this is in fact the instrument that when you hear the trumpets blew down the walls of Jericho, oh, that you hear that them. song. That yeah. was the shofar, um, and it's about seven thousand years old, and it and sounds like it. <laughs> That's right. And being made out of a ram's horn, it kind of, you've got it. You've got it. Excellent. And being made out of a ram's horn, it kind of stinks, too. So, oh, uh, how know, fun for you. Oh, you they still, get too they still make them out of sheep. They don't make them out of uh, brass or something. No, no, no. It's the real deal. Wow. Absolutely. You said once you could play anything that, that blows. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> he, can, he, can, he can. Here's a small shofar there, there's uh, a on Wikipedia. Yeah. My goodness, how interesting. Exactly right. So they just, they're hollow, and they just cut a hole at the end, and uh, you, you can that's blow That's exactly it. right. And you blow it like a, like a trumpet. It's a very tiny mouthpiece, so French horn players have the easiest time with it. Uh -huh. uh, being a tuba player, I, I had a little trouble at first getting used to that tiny little mouthpiece, but um, I now do it, and uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting ancient sound it's almost like musical it. archaeology i love it well yeah and we talked a little bit about the sack butt and some of these old medieval instruments too which i love i love the sound they're yeah. not they're, the, the tuning isn't very accurate but they but it's great i just really love that sound yeah it really is something it's re it's really cool good uh, the other thing i want to mention real quick is that my website ultimateavmag.com is currently running a sweepstakes oh boy uh, we are giving away a, the entire trilogy of Lord of the Rings on Blu-ray. Ooh, I have that. I bought that. It was great. It's really good. If you have it's time. Really, yeah, if you have time to watch it. Because it's not only the, like, 12 hours of movie, there's, yeah. like, another day's worth of extras. That's right. Um, so we're giving away a package of that, plus a bunch of um, uh, exclusive swag from, from Warner, from the company that, that uh, makes the uh, movie. All you have to do is go to my website, ultimateavmag.com, register, uh, which is give us a username and, a, and your email address, uh, then log on and post a comment on the Sweepstakes blog, which is at the top of the homepage, and uh, you'll be entered to win. And uh, that will the drawing will take place uh, after uh, the end of this month, right on October 1st, and uh, some lucky commenter will win this entire package. So... Cool. I encourage people to go and check it out. Let me uh, let me know uh, when you get a winner, and we can uh, we can send them some uh, supplies. <laughs> Excellent, because <laughs> they're going to need it. <laughs> I'm excited. You know, uh, they finally announced uh, Luke George Lucas at uh, Celebration Four in uh, Florida last week or a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Finally announced they're going to do Star Wars on Blu-ray. Uh, I can't wait. Somebody at brought... least for the first three, or the, well, episodes four through six. Yeah. I'm not as big a fan oh, of what Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I couldn't care less about anything with Jabba the... What is his name? No, uh... Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, you! I could take him or leave him. But, uh, but somebody brought us the laser discs because uh, they did put them out on laser disc, and then very late they put them out on DVD, and, and George said an interesting thing, and maybe I'd love, I'd love to know what you think of this. He hmm? said, we wait until there's enough of a market. We made a mistake putting them out on DVD too soon, and we couldn't sell enough of them. Really? George, George is one of the richest men in the world, and now you know why. <laughs> he said we couldn't sell we didn't sell as many as we thought we ought to because not enough people had DVDs so we've been waiting on Blu-ray uh, he said it's very expensive to make these which I suppose it is but it, I mean it, it really on. is that's true the guy's a I mean look he's gonna make money I mean money he's a bazillionaire it. yeah, yeah. It's not gonna. It's not gonna. He's not gonna lose money. I guess it's a question of how much he's gonna make. But he said he wanted to wait until Blu-ray was established enough, and now it is. He feels, and he's gonna put mm -hmm. it on Blu-ray. He better hurry because Blue. It's about the physical media is dying already. Well, well, I, I'm not entirely sure about that, but um, you yes, you we, think you, I mean, we're definitely with with Apple's new TV, with Google mm -hmm. TV coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think we're moving towards digital content. I know it, I know for the video file like you, and I yeah. would include myself, there's nothing like Blu-ray. Physical media gives you the highest quality, 1080p, That's yeah. and, and, and downloads won't for some time. Nevertheless, downloads for many people are good enough. 
Yes, I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you. I myself resist it because I want that best quality. I want that Blu-ray. But uh, I have to say you're exactly correct. Uh, digital downloads are gaining a lot of strength, a lot of steam. And uh, so uh, Blu-ray may very well be the last physical media that, that we see before it becomes irrelevant. Just like as you were talking about before, you know, print. Uh, Ultimate AV Magazine used to be a print magazine, and now it's online only, just like PC Mag yeah. and so many others. Um, you know, it, it really does make a lot of sense in that case um, because, I mean, you know, print is, I mean, words are words, right? Whether you read them on a screen or read them on a page, that really doesn't matter. Where, where it matters to me is the quality of the video and the audio uh, coming down the pipe isn't quite as good yet as uh, what you get on a physical disc. So that's why I'm still a champion of Blu-ray, but I do agree, you know, for most people, it's plenty good enough what they get uh, downloaded, and, and it is getting better. I will say that also. I think what you're going to see, and of course there's extras on Blu-ray and, and even DVD that you don't get in downloads, but I That's think what correct. you're going to see uh, uh, in time is there will be video files, just as there are audio files now who pay extra, who go through more trouble to listen to music so it sounds better. Mm -hmm. There will be video files in the same way, but the vast mm -hmm. amount of music is sold to be played on an iPod as a compressed MP3 using crappy earbuds. I think mm -hmm. you're going to say the same thing with video. It yep. will be a specialty. Hey, hang on. Let's come back and talk some more with Scott Wilkinson. What you bet. Say? Thanks. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More after this. I've been getting shofar lessons from Scott, Scott, Scott Wilkinson in the break. Scott is the uh, home theater wizard at Ultimate AV Magazine, ultimateavmag.com. He's also a columnist for Home Theater Magazine, hometheatermag.com. Joins us every week to talk about home theater. We had so little time we ran out. I, I, I thought, let's get him back on. You have a question from a uh, reader? I do. Actually, uh, from a listener, from somebody who called you last week. Uh, who, uh, who His name is Brian, and he was asking, he's, he has a Yamaha... RX V1 receiver, uh, which just died, and he wanted to replace it. And he was asking about that and also about 720p versus 1080p displays and whether or not a 50-inch display sitting 10 or 12 feet away, uh, would he see the difference? So let me take those two questions. Okay. Um, the Yamaha RX V1 was the flagship receiver of Yamaha quite some years ago now. Um, and he went to Best Buy and he said, eh, we, don't, we don't carry anything that's sort of of that quality. You might want to consider separates. And what that means is, uh, whereas an AV receiver includes what's called a preamplifier processor or what we call a pre-pro, which has a bunch of inputs for all your gear and it processes the audio and maybe processes the video, that's one part. And the second part of a receiver in the same box is a multi-channel power amplifier, which takes that signal that you've selected in the pre-pro, like you want to listen, you want to watch your Blu-ray player, you want to watch your cable box, you want to listen to CDs, and then sends that signal, amplifies it, and sends it out to the speakers. Now, separates, as the name implies, separates out those two functions into two different boxes. Why would you want to do that? Well, there are those, uh, most audiophiles prefer separates uh, because they feel, and probably rightly so, that separating those functions eliminates some possibility of interference, of, of stuff going on inside the box between the two. So if they're in separate boxes, they can't interfere with each other. So that may very well lead to some slight increase in audio quality. And the Best Buy guy told Brian that uh, the two brands that he would recommend were called Outlaw and yeah, Evo. I, and, and, yeah, go ahead. And that was the question he really had is, have you ever heard of Outlaw? What do you think? Or Evotech? What do you think? It's actually Emotiva. Emotiva, that's it, yes. Emotiva, yes. And I, I have heard of both of them. I know Outlaw very well. And I am very impressed with their products, really? particularly quality for price. They are an extremely good value proposition. So they're like the Vizio of receivers, kind of. Uh, of, of receivers and separates. And separates, okay. They, they actually make a separate pre-pro and uh, power amp. And are they, they also make some receivers as well. Are, made, are they made by another bigger name, well-known name, or is it just Outlaw? Is the, is the, this is a terrible <laughs> name, I have to tell you. <laughs> well, they are an offshoot. I don't know if exactly if they're an offshoot, but they're, they're headed by the same guy who does Atlantic Technology Speakers. Okay. His okay. name is Peter Tribeman, and he's, he's a very good guy. And uh, they're online only also. They aren't sold in stores. Ah. 
Okay. O only on their website. I think it must be outlaw.com. I don't remember exactly, but if you Google outlaw, you'll, you'll find it clearly. Uh, outlaw audio anyway, certainly. Uh, so I know their products very well. They're very well regarded. Emotiva has the same reputation, exactly. But I've never actually tried any of their products, so I can't say from personal experience. Uh, but I do know a lot of people send me email that, that says they love their Emotiva stuff. So, you know, given that, given secondhand evaluations, I have to say they're probably you know, in the same ballpark in terms yeah. of quality and I, value. I looked up, uh, after, when he called, I looked up Outlaw uh, and, and CNET who had reviewed them and gave them quite good reviews. So I, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I had seen some, some good things. Yeah, Scott absolutely. Wilkinson is the host. Uh, it is outlawaudio.com, by the way. Thank you, Jeremy. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Scott Wilkinson is the host of the Home Theater Geeks podcast. You can listen to that at twit, T-W-I-T dot TV slash H-T-G. Well, you'll find a link at techguylabs.com, of course. And he does the show every Monday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 4.30 uh, Eastern Time at live.twit.tv. Who's on tomorrow? Ooh, Fred Mantagian. Uh, he's a writer for Home Theater Magazine, has been for a long time. A very entertaining fellow. <laughs> very, um, his writing is among the best I have seen. Uh, very creative, very humorous. Uh, we're going to be just talking about all kinds of stuff. Uh, he's what he's been reviewing lately. Um, his thoughts on uh, vinyl. We were talking about you were talking about vinyl earlier mm -hmm. uh, as being another uh, sort of throwback to analog days that are, is now kind of a luxury item. It's actually pretty expensive to buy vinyl records and to buy turntables. Um, although one other guest of mine, Michael Fremer, said you don't have to spend a bundle on turntables. He thought you could get a pretty good deal for three hundred and fifty bucks on oh. a turntable, something okay. like that. Now he just spent you know, like a hundred grand <laughs> on this turntable no, from Australia uh, that, that, that he says his wife in, said, in fact said, wow, this is better than sex. <laughs> Even if it's better than sex, it's not a hundred grand. I'm sorry. Scott Wilkinson, Ultimate Theater, uh, Ultimate uh, AV Magazine, UltimateAVMag.com, Home Theater Magazine, HomeTheaterMag.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk again next week. You bet. Thank you, Scott. Take care. Yeah. Bye.